Shahid Bolson sheds light on the hidden flaws of the American system and how it has often worked against the very citizens it was designed to serve. With recent perspectives and insightful analysis, Bolson unpacks the intricate web of policies and structures that have led to widespread disillusionment among Americans. Discover how systemic issues impact everyday lives in the urgent need for reform. Now let's listen to what Shahid Bolson has to say about why nobody can hate Americans more than the American government. I don't hate the West. I don't hate America. We hate evil and wrongdoing, and you should too. But they've got you thinking that you have, uh, you have to uh, uh, patriotically defend the evil and wrongdoing that your country does, even when you yourselves are really the worst victims of your own so-called civilization. That's the worst part of all this. As I've said before, uh, the only real conspiracy theory that I believe in is the conspiracy of Shaitan, of Iblis. Uh, and he mobilizes in societies those sectors of the society according to their own agendas to serve his agenda. And his agenda is to lead as many people into hell as possible. His agenda is to try to prove that his contempt for Nabi Adam alayhi salam was justified. So he wants to prove that human beings are worthless. He wants to prove that they're contemptible. So there's another deeper reason why they want to say that America represents the freest country in the world. Think about that. Why Shaitan wants you to have that impression. Because uh, free, theoretically, means the most natural state, the least controlled state, the least uh, coerced, and the most organic expression of human life and of human society. American society, therefore, must represent uh, the best uh, representation of the true nature of human beings. That's why freedom is the key point in America's image in this grand scheme of things. Because if this is what humanity is supposed to look like uh, when it's left free, then we're surely just as bad as Iblis thought we were. America has become the largest consumer of pornography in the world, which is an industry of degradation that reduces human beings to objects, dehumanizes relationships, and turns intimacy uh, into a spectacle for profit. America's number one, the undisputed champion uh, of this exploitation. Every second of every day, every second, over 30,000 Americans are viewing uh, filthy, explicit content. And each viewing takes them another step away from the sacredness of intimacy and all the blessings that is uh, produced by the intimacy between men and women, between a husband and a wife. America's youth are engaged in sexual activity at an earlier age than almost anywhere else, with nearly 40% of high school students uh, having had intercourse before they even reach 17. This hookup culture isn't just tolerated, it's celebrated, it's encouraged, and it's sold to young people as if it's some kind of an achievement. You sexualize your young uh, without ever maturing them. In their high schools, their colleges, and in, in, in your media, young people are told uh, that commitment is a burden, that restraint is repressive, and that uh, pleasure is the only purpose. This isn't freedom. This is engineering. Then look at what they call their alternative lifestyles which they celebrate as kinks and fetishes and what have you. In America, nearly half of the entire population openly engages in so-called non-traditional sexual behaviors, from bondage to role play to things that I won't even say aloud. These practices are marketed uh, and embraced as part of modern life. They transgress the limits of decency, of, no of normality, and the media glamorizes that and makes perversion normal. They make it seem like it's even healthy. But what is this if not the complete perversion of intimacy, of normal relationships? This isn't an, a, an organic expression of humanity. It's a corruption of it. And it's calculated. Their own surveys show that infidelity is on the rise in that country. Especially among the young. With almost one in five married people admitting to cheating on their spouse. That's the ones who admit it. Infidelity isn't just a personal failure, it's a social disease, a breakdown of the very structure that holds societies together. What does that tell you about their definition of freedom? About their value of their rights? If loyalty and trust are cast aside as old-fashioned, as obstacles to uh, 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 satisfying individual desire, which is the, the prime objective, and when these desires are left unchecked, it's no surprise that their country leads the developed world in sexually transmitted diseases. Over 2.3 million cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, 
and syphilis were reported in one single year. The CDC uh, says that America accounts for 30% of gonorrhea cases worldwide. There's almost a million abortions each year. That's a society that views its own offspring as disposable. And again, these are pregnancies that are almost always the result uh, of intercourse that should have never taken place. But they promote promiscuity. They discourage uh, impulse control. They devalue intimacy and relationships. And they constantly depict the relationship between men and women as adversarial and hostile. And then when a pregnancy occurs... After a series of bad decisions and bad choices, they talk about the right to choose. When what they mean is the right to avoid the consequences of the choices that they've already made. They made women think that empowerment means being just as unaccountable as the society allows men to be. Because men can walk away from women whom they impregnate, uh, so women should be able to terminate those pregnancies. Freedom from accountability. That's what it means. Freedom from accountability for all. This is what they've brainwashed you to think. This isn't natural. It's an engineered message. But you know, they always uh, have seen children as disposable, seen them as burdens. Research the orphan trains, if you don't know about it. Thousands of children uh, shipped out of the cities, out to the West, and just distributed to anyone who wanted, you know, child labor, uh, uh, to work on farms or to work in mines, or, or even worse. Yes, the United States, and until today, uh, has one of the highest rates of child sexual abuse in the Western world. One in five American children will experience abuse on average before they ever reach adulthood. Hundreds of thousands of young girls and young boys are trafficked and exploited every single year in that country. And child protective services have been proven to act as procurers, as suppliers of children. They have a drug and alcohol fueled culture Binge drinking and substance abuse aren't just tolerated. They're part of the mainstream American culture. Their own statistics show, obviously, that substance abuse is strongly linked to risky, often reckless sexual behavior, which results in serious consequences like unplanned pregnancies, like STDs, and like sexual assault. But all of this is celebrated. Think about the endless shows, the endless songs and movies that glamorize promiscuity, glamorize infidelity and sexual adventure. This is a society saturated uh, with hypersexualized content, a place where dignity and modesty are ridiculed, where decency is painted as repression. This is enslavement to desires, to impulses, to shaitan's whispers, to the wuswasa of shaitan. If this is the most free society, the most natural society, then human beings must be debased. They must be atrocious creatures. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of, of, of pretending that America is so free. They want you to think that this society is a natural outcome of people being free. That this is what happens when individuals are left to follow their own will without constraint and without rules. They want you to believe that this state of affairs represents human nature at its core, that this is the truest, most organic expression of the human spirit, that if people were free from every shackle, from every rule, uh, then this dystopia would be the inevitable result, would be the inevitable end. They want you to look at the decay, the despair, the depravity, uh, and see it as an unfiltered, raw version of humanity, a bleases version of humanity. Look at the violence. More than 48,000 uh, deaths each year by gunfire. You've got children dying as the victims of bullets uh, and mass shootings in a place that insists that they're the world's policemen. They'll tell us this is all part of the natural order, right? A free society. But this level of terror, of instability, of bloodshed in the streets, that's not freedom. This is a culture where security has been sacrificed for profit and for power because only profit and only power deserve to be secure and protected, deserve to be served and protected. That's the culture. They want you to look at the education system in America and believe that illiteracy and crumbling schools are just part of the natural struggle of a free nation. But how can that be? How can this be natural when the wealthiest country in the world so-called, has one in five adults who are unable to read or complete basic tasks. How can it be anything but a failure 
that millions of children are denied a basic education, that millions will be pushed into a lifetime of poverty. They want you to think that's human nature? This is not human nature, this is neglect. It's a betrayal of the very people that they claim to empower, that that so-called civilization claims to empower better than anyone else. And look at homelessness, the misery of families living on the streets, in tents, in cars, over half a million people on any given night in the United States with nowhere to call home. Millions more who are barely able to afford their rent who are just moments away from homelessness. They'll tell you again, what, that this is the natural result of an open economy, of a free market economy, that some will rise and some will fall. That's just how freedom works. But this is not freedom. This isn't the freedom that they promise. This is abandonment. A society that discards its own people and tells them that that's just the way it is. And why don't you call them what they really are? Why do you say homeless? Why do you say unhoused? They are internally displaced people. Displaced by your own system, by your own society. Refugees with no refuge. Not by a traditional war, but by a system that functions as a form of economic war against its own population. Is it any wonder that they have an epidemic of mental illness in that country? Over 21% of American adults suffer from mental health issues. Nearly half of teens express having feelings of a deep uh, sadness, depression, and hopelessness. Another 48,000 lives every year are lost to suicide because they've normalized isolation. They've normalized empty consumption and an endless chase for meaning in a society that offers you none. They want you to think this is natural? This isn't human nature. It's a distortion of it. This is the result of a culture that strips life of any purpose and, and, and strips society of community itself. I mean, a human being would not commit self-murder if they lived in a society that values human beings. And look at the devastation of addiction in that country. It's just another form of suicide, just slow motion. 100,000 people dying of uh, drug overdoses in a single year. Families destroyed, communities hollowed out by opioids, fentanyl, substances that numb people from the misery around them. Is this addiction the mark of a free spirit? Or is it a symptom of lives emptied of any kind of connection? And people who've been made to feel worthless, who are seeking some kind of an escape from a reality that seems inescapable. But they want you to accept it as natural. But this is the consequence of a society that feeds on people's weakness, that profits from their suffering. I'm telling you, your own so-called civilization hates you. And you accuse me uh, of hating America when no one could possibly hate you more than America hates you. No one could hate the American people more than the American system and the American society hates itself. You put your, your own people in debt, buried under $17 trillion worth of debt, struggling under the weight of a system that promises prosperity but delivers poverty. 40% of Americans can't even uh, uh, afford any unexpected expenses. This is survival of the richest, not survival of the fittest. That's not freedom, and that's not natural. And they want you to believe that poverty and hunger, uh, even in this uh, so-called land of abundance, is just, again, part of the natural order. There's nothing that can be done about it. Over 37 million people who are in poverty in America, over 34 million who are food insecure, including children. Now, this isn't natural. It's an abomination. It's the product of a society that co-modified everything, even the basic necessities of life putting profit above people at every level. Most people are so misled by American propaganda about itself that they can't even process or register what they see themselves and experience in their own lives. So they actually are living uh, in third world conditions, most of them, but they believe that they're living in the richest country in the world. No, you don't live in the richest country in the world. You have the richest individuals in the world living in your country. That's all. And you'll never be one of them. Do you know what percentage of Americans are billionaires? 0.0002%. 95% of Americans can't even make a six-figure income. There's only 800 individuals in your country. 800 individuals, and they have more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire population. In America, infants and mothers die at rates higher than in any other uh, developed country in the world, so-called developed. The broken infrastructure that you've got, the broken roads, the crumbling bridges, public services, that's your free market system. And you're told to be proud of it. And it's going to get worse. 60% of Americans feel isolated, feel detached, feel bereft of community. It's not natural. 
to be so alone, to feel so alone, to feel so distrustful, so fragmented. This is the outcome of a culture that has abandoned the natural values that bring people together. This is not the natural state of free people. This is what happens when societies are led by greed and exploitation, a system that chews people up and spits them out, anyone who can't keep up. But they want you to look at America and think that this is what freedom looks like. But don't be deceived. This is what happens when a society turns away from faith, turns away from humanity, turns away from its purpose. This is what happens when freedom is defined as license for indulgence, for excess. When free means free to destroy oneself and others. It's not natural. It's unnatural. It's abnormal. And it's a highly controlled and engineered mutation. Americans and Westerners more broadly have been profoundly victimized by the very so-called civilization that claims to uplift them and that they claim to be superior. They've been deprived of the psychological, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual tools necessary to understand, to articulate, and to confront their own reality. They're trapped in a shallow existence starved of anything deeper than, uh, than the material, unable to break through the veneer of consumerism, triviality, and distraction. It smothers every aspect of their lives. I mean, imagine a society that gives people endless distractions, but denies them any meaning. They're flooded with entertainment, they're drowned in advertisements, uh, and they're fed a steady diet of vapid pop culture that tells them what to want, how to live, and who to be. There's no room for introspection. There's no room for nuance. There's no room for the profound. They're told from birth that happiness is something that they can buy and that their purpose is prosperity, that contentment is a collection of possessions or a luxury brand or what have you. They're allowed to explore every surface, but never the depths. Life for them has been reduced to a series of momentary pleasures, temporary fixes. But beneath the surface, there's emptiness. You know, beneath the smiles, beneath the sitcoms, uh, the sarcastic jokes, there's a deep, unresolved turmoil. But how can they articulate it? How can they express what they're feeling when the only language that they've ever been given uh, is one of superficiality? When the only emotional vocabulary that they have is shaped by casual, uh, trivial interactions, fleeting social media trends, hollow slogans, empty slogans, and all the lies that they've ever been told. They can't express their pain because they've been trained anyway to keep it light, to make everything a joke because the joke is being made on them. They can never dig too deep. They have to be witty. They have to be casual. They have to treat every serious issue with a glib, dismissive attitude. You see it even in their approach to politics, their approach to social issues. Serious matters are reduced to just hashtags. Complex realities are squeezed into memes. The culture demands that everything be simplified, that nothing can be taken too seriously, uh, and that everyone keep up the act of perpetual nonchalance. It's as if they become mutes, unable to speak, unable to speak the truth of their own suffering. Because they've been stripped of the language. They've been stripped of the mindset. They've been stripped of the vocabulary. They've been stripped of the courage to even look within. The institutions that they rely on for understanding the world, their media, their schools, their government, uh, only perpetuates this shallow view of life, this sh a shallow presentation of life. They're not given tools to reflect, only tools to consume. They're shown endless products, endless services that claim to make them happy but they're never shown how to find any purpose. They're told how to fit in, but not how to be whole. There's no encouragement to uh, uh, explore questions of meaning in America, in the West, to ask who they are, why they are, what they should believe in, what they do believe in, where they're going. Instead, there's just a relentless push to buy, to upgrade, to acquire, to impress. Life itself is transactional. Friendships, relationships, even one's own sense of self-worth. Everything has become a commodity. And in the process, they've lost their own rootedness. They've lost any sense of rootedness, of continuity, of belonging to something larger than themselves. 
They become fragments of people just floating from one superficial experience to the next, never truly connecting with others and never truly connecting even with their own souls. This is what happens when a society loses its moral and spiritual foundation, if it ever had one. When people are told that value comes from what they own, not who they are, and not by what they do, and when they're taught to measure success in dollars and in uh, social media likes rather than in integrity and compassion and the ability to sleep at night and the ability to face their Lord uh, on the uh, judgment day, well, the human spirit atrophies. People become hollow. And they're just performing roles rather than living as whole human beings. They translate their trauma into irony, into sarcasm, into cynicism. Because they've been deprived of any access to real depth. So they keep everything glib, everything witty, everything distant, everything remote. They live in a society that insists on treating serious issues with a smirk. That reduces the sacred to the trivial. Even when faced with real suffering, homelessness, addiction, mental illness, they've got plenty of suffering. They don't know how, they don't have a framework. They don't have the depth. They don't have the language to confront it honestly. They don't know how to sit with grief, how to engage with pain, how to feel anger for injustice. They've been trained to look away, keep scrolling, distract yourselves, numb yourselves, rather than face the truth of what's happening all around them and what's happening to them and what's happening within them. They've been told that any depth of feeling, any genuine emotion, any serious conversation, it's too much, it's too heavy, it's too intense uh, for a culture that's built on convenience and quick fixes. They're a society that moves too fast for introspection. It prioritizes ease over truth, values surface over substance, style over substance, so they live in turmoil, but unable to express it, unable to break free from the cultural demand to keep things light, to stay on the surface, never be a buzzkill, you know? So they just wander, lost in this so-called civilization that prides itself on freedom, but that's made them prisoners in, in more ways than you can count. And they don't see it as unnatural because they've been taught that this is human nature itself. And that's the most profound tragedy of it all. Americans are like that unwanted, rejected, neglected, and abused child who's never been prepared for adulthood. Individually and as a society, they're adrift. They're unprepared. They're unsure of who they are and what they believe. That's why you have 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, senior citizens who still don't know what, what they want to be when they grow up. Why, well, it's a shame. It's a deep and diabolical shame. And the bitter irony is that this neglected, broken child still postures like he's the most loved, the most special, the most brilliant, the most talented, and the most important human being in the world. This posture of superiority is all he has left, so he clings to it fiercely, lashes out at anyone who questions it. He's been taught from his earliest history that violence equals strength. That violence makes you right. That violence is how you silence objection. But no matter how many voices he can quiet, he'll never quiet the voice in his own head. He's so accustomed to silencing others that he believes that he can do the same uh, with the torment that's going on in his own mind. That's American society. He hates anyone who speaks the truth to that emptiness. Anyone who articulates something deeper because the truth shines a light on his own incapacity to comprehend it. It exposes the shallowness of his worldview. He sees others who understand their place in the world, who have roots, who feel at home in their culture and at home in their beliefs, and he resents them deeply. He resents them because they possess something that he's been denied, a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. Instead, his society has filled him with hollow promises and empty slogans. Freedom, they tell him. Individuality, they tell him. But what's it really actually given him? A freedom to consume without meaning, to express without connection, to live without love and, and without loyalty. That's what freedom has left him. It's left him spiritually destitute, trying to fill the void with things, with distractions, 
when he sees others who don't need those distractions, who don't live for consumption alone, well, he despises them because they make him feel uh, even more like an outsider to his own soul. That's why he turns away from real introspection, why he dismisses depth and spirituality as old-fashioned or as oppressive or what have you. The very idea of facing himself is terrifying. Because that would mean confronting a lifetime of empty pursuits. Superficial values. So he runs from himself. Living out a cycle of distraction and denial and despair. And all the while uh, insisting that he's free. It's a freedom to not be able to understand your own pain. To be trapped in a cycle of empty pleasure and deeper emptiness. No, this isn't freedom. This is slavery to illusion. It's the imprisonment uh, of a mind that's been kept in perpetual adolescence, never allowed to grow, never allowed to mature, to discover what it really means to truly live. So he fears anyone uh, who has broken free and who lives with purpose and with faith and with a moral code that can see beyond the fleeting desires of the moment. He fears uh, anyone uh, whose values aren't for sale, whose beliefs can't be shaken uh, by whatever's popular or unpopular. And in that fear, he lashes out, cling, clinging to his illusions, desperate to protect the fragile identity that he's built on a foundation of sand. This is the tragedy. He doesn't see his own captivity. He's been conditioned to believe that this hollow, shallow existence is human nature, is the human condition. Striving for more than that is impossible. Wanting more than that is naive or even self-oppression. So he drifts, clutching to this, the, the distractions of pop culture, of consumerism, of constant entertainment, to keep from falling into the terrifying silence of his own unaddressed turmoil. And they call it freedom, but it's the opposite. That's like saying a boat that has no anchor, that has no rudder, that has no uh, sail, that's just tossed aimlessly about the ocean. That's freedom. That's what freedom is to you. No, it's a disaster. America has to be liberated from this so-called freedom, from this so-called civilization. Real civilization, true advancement, uh, means rising above the superficial. It means embracing the complexities of life and understanding them, not simplifying them, uh, into just slogans or empty promises or what have you. It means giving people the tools to understand their own hearts, their own purpose, their place in the world. It means giving them a true sense of identity and meaning and purpose, a true connection to other people, and a true grounding in something that's greater than themselves. Americans like orphans, without roots, abandoned by a system that just uses them, exploits them, and leaves them empty. And this system tells them that this is all there is. That human life is just a series of transactions, just a series of distractions. A race to accumulate uh, as much as you can until there's nothing left, including you. That's not freedom, it's contempt. And until they recognize it for what it is, they will continue to drift, unmoored, lost, and unable to find a way out. And they'll lash out at anyone who dares to say that there's something more. Because then, that, then they'll have to face and confront the fact that they've been deprived for centuries. They know that this emptiness is not what they were meant for. They know that there's something inside, that there's true freedom, but it doesn't look like this. No, I don't hate America. I hate what America has done to Americans and what so-called Western civilization has done to Westerners because it's atrocious. It's criminal. They have betrayed you. They have betrayed their own people. No one can possibly hate a people more uh, than someone who believes that those people cannot be good and then makes those people believe it about themselves. You can't hate a people more than if you believe that they're worthless and make them believe about themselves that they are worthless. You can't hate a people more than if you don't even care uh, about their morality, about their deeds, about their actions, about their decency, about their goodness, and then you make them also not care about any of these things. I think that what has been done and what is being done to the people in America, spiritually, psychologically, and intellectually, and morally, 
Well, I think it's horrific, and I think it's criminal. And the same applies to the West more broadly. The children of Adam salam deserve better than that, and that includes the people of the West, that includes the people of America. But you're never going to get out of the prison that you're in as long as you think that it's a luxury hotel. A voice from Istanbul introducing Shahid Bolson. Shahid Bolson might seem like an unlikely critic of the American system. He lives in Istanbul, Turkey. He converted to Islam. But Bolson is also an American. He sees the flaws in the system, and he isn't afraid to point them out. Bolson speaks directly to young people. He uses social media to share his message. He talks about how corporations have too much power. He shows how the wealthy elite rigged the system in their favor. His words resonate with many who feel left behind. Bolson's critique is sharp. He doesn't sugarcoat the truth. He says America is failing its own people. He points to the growing gap between the rich and the poor. He highlights the struggles of ordinary Americans. Bolson's message is clear. The American dream is fading. The system is broken. It's time for a change. Rigged Game Economic Inequality and Corporate Power in America The American Dream promises prosperity. Work hard and you can achieve anything. But for many, this dream is out of reach. The gap between the rich and the poor is wider than ever. The middle class is shrinking. Corporate greed is a major culprit. Big corporations prioritize profits over people. They lobby politicians to pass laws that benefit them. They donate millions to election campaigns. They use their influence to rig the system in their favor. This creates an uneven playing field. Ordinary Americans don't have the same access to power. They struggle to make their voices heard. They feel forgotten and ignored. The result? A system that benefits the few at the expense of the many. A system where corporations thrive while ordinary people struggle. Freedom. The COVID change. Bolson doesn't just criticize the system. He offers a way forward. He advocates for nonviolent resistance. He draws inspiration from historical movements like the American Labor Movement and the Civil Rights Movement. Bolson believes in the power of grassroots organizing. He encourages people to hold corporations accountable. He urges them to demand better from their elected officials. He wants people to reclaim their power. Bolson's message is one of hope. He believes that change is possible. He knows that ordinary people can make a difference. He calls on everyone to join the fight for a more just and equitable society.